Hey, LVC. Jeremy here with an update following President Kenyatta's address yesterday. I'm recording this on Saturday, the 27th. And indeed, sadly, we are not going to be able to gather on Easter Sunday, even with 100 or 50 or, or really many people at all. We're going to be recording the service once again. And church, it is sad. We had been gearing up for this. We had been excited. We had a whole team last Sunday of gracious volunteers, around 20 or so at McKinney School, getting ready for you, as many of you as could join on Easter Sunday. But of course, we want to honor and submit to the government's decision. I believe it's a wise decision that I respect. And indeed, church, we were leaning this way as elders. As much as we had been waiting for a long time, um, we were looking at the situation over the past week and just realized this is getting really bad. So what do we need to do? Well, the government did make the decision for us. And of course, we want to honor and submit to and respect that. Now, a number of you had been understandably asking a number of weeks ago, like, what are we waiting for? Well, it turns out this is actually basically what we were waiting for, this kind of another wave. And so the timing is really hard because, of course, we had been waiting for a while. I confess, I look back and wish, gosh, could, if we could have met a few times in February to at least regather and be together. Uh, at the very least, we did not want to contribute to something like another wave like this that has gotten so bad. So church, we we are concerned about what's going on. And like you and other believers around the city, we are praying for the current situation. And so with the government's directive, uh, even the challenge for pastors to encourage and exhort our congregations, church, we got to do what we can to double down right now during this lockdown. So look, the three W's of wearing your mask, watching your distance, washing your hands. we got to be doing these things. Number one, you, you go around and you see people who are not wearing their mask at all, as if life is just normal. Look, wearing the mask is so annoying. My nose has never itched like it has in the last 30 days for whatever weird reason. So it's annoying to wear a mask, but look, it's not that hard. We can wear our mask. Very few people have a condition where it's hard for them to wear it completely. But for the rest of us, is as annoying as it is, let's just wear our mask. Number two, watch your distance. A number of you have to be out there for your livelihood and it's harder to watch your distance, but as best we can, we've got to follow that protocol as well. I go around to, to different malls or I'm out and about and I see people who are clearly from different households going up and hugging each other. And I look at it and I say, I, I get it. And I'm also jealous because I want to be doing that, but we can't. We can't be doing that kind of thing. we got to show love in other ways, including by wearing the mask and watching our distance. And then number three, of course, just washing our hands. There's sanitizer everywhere. Let's just be as cautious and as careful as we can. We can still go out and try to do things in life, like meeting with someone in a garden. Um, but let's just do our best church in the midst of trying to do life to do these three W's and love our neighbors in that way. So what does this mean for the long term? Well, it's hard to say exactly. And of course, the government will direct us on when churches can regather. Now, as we look over these next couple of years, this is just me speaking here on my own. I think as we look at a couple of years down the road until there's herd immunity because of increased vaccination in Kenya, uh, there will be different waves that come along. And it will be hard to say that we can't ever not meet and regather as a church. And so I think as an eldership, we're gonna be looking at that to see, because we think we can do it safely. And when we do so church, we're gonna be quite strict because we do not wanna to contribute to yet another wave in the future. But when this goes down, whether it's May or June or whenever, um, we're gonna talk about what we doing what we can to try and regather. Um, and when it comes to vaccines, let me just say briefly, and we're gonna have more on this in the upcoming weeks, but as you see news about the vaccine, let me encourage you, if you're 58 and above, if you meet any of those categories, to do go out and get a vaccine. The more people who get vac vaccinated in Kenya, the better. I know there's a lot of misinformation going around. And church, as followers of Jesus, who are called to love God with our minds, let us not give in to any of these conspiracy theories and misinformation Please don't resort to shallow internet research where you could find one or 10 or 100 articles. Let's rely on the best science and data that we can. If you've got questions, reach out and ask us. We have internal experts who can advise on what it's really saying. Nothing is perfect. 
But we want to do what we can to help flatten the curve and to love our neighbors. So church, we love you. Look, sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. This is a really hard time. But as we enter into Holy Week, let's think about how our Lord suffered on our behalf. But resurrection was coming. Okay, Friday will not be the last word. Sunday is coming. And we're going to rejoice whether we're together or not, because we have this hope in the resurrection of Jesus. Love you, church. Good morning, LVC. My name is Lily Bakala Piper, and happy Palm Sunday to you. This is not really a palm leaf, but it'll have to do. It's my great privilege to be with you this morning and to give the word. I'm one of the members here at Lavington Vineyard Church, and we come to you this morning at the end of another long week um, with the news of a new lockdown here in Kenya and rising COVID cases, situations kind of all over the world that have our hearts just, you know, troubled. There's hate crimes and gun violence in the United States, a war in Ethiopia, a tragic uh, train crash in Egypt. There is restlessness and unsettlement. There's job loss. And many of us have loved ones who are in the hospital right now. Many of us have been at bedsides and gravesides in recent weeks. And so before I start today's sermon, I just want to take a moment and have a moment of prayer. So whoever you're with today, or if you're just alone, would you just join me in a moment of prayer um, this morning? Father, this Palm Sunday, we remember that you came into the city and you were greeted with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And just in a few days later, God, those shouts would turn to something much darker. And God, we feel like we are just at that moment, Lord. We're in a Good Friday moment where we don't yet have the tangible sense of maybe something good coming out of our circumstances, God. But Lord, we know that you are good. And not only are you good, but you're a good father. You're a good friend. You're a good and faithful savior. So God, we do just come to you today with our loved ones in our hands and we present them before you and say, God, touch them, heal them, keep them, Lord. We come to you with our countries that we call home or a second home or an adopted home, Lord. We bring those countries before you and we say, God, have mercy. Come and deliver and comfort and protect, God. Lord, we come to you with our questions and our uncertainties, our worries about what's ahead, God. We have lived an entire year in this pandemic, in different phases of lockdown, and here in Kenya, Lord, we enter another lockdown. And so, Lord, we just say, have mercy, Lord, for those who are worried about jobs, schooling, opportunities for their businesses, their families, their kids, Lord. Lord, give us hope or help us to see the hope that you are, Lord Jesus. I'm reminded of a song that I listened to this week, Lord, that said, hope is a person, and that is you, Jesus. You are our hope. So God, this Palm Sunday, the beginning of the resurrection season, God, remind us who we are, that we are yours. We are the children of a good father. We are the children of a good shepherd, Lord. And we put before you our loved ones, our questions, our hopes, our homes, Lord. And we know that we can trust you, Lord Jesus. We know that we can trust you. So, Father, we thank you for your love, and we surrender this morning to you. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me with prayer, and thank you for being with us this morning, this Palm Sunday morning, the week before Easter. And in fact, this year, um, Palm Sunday also coincides with Passover, the start of Passover, which started yesterday. And for the first time in a couple of years, the Passover will conclude on Resurrection Sunday. And so it's a real moment for us to look back and remember not just the hope of the empty tomb, but also that God has been in the business of liberation and resurrection for hundreds of years. And so we welcome all of you to this Sunday morning. Today's message, we continue in the book of Luke, chapter 23. And um, I have to say, this message today really is kind of targeted on people who are already following Jesus. 
So if you're joining us this morning and you're still thinking about faith and you're not sure where you stand, you are so welcome. I think you can still get something from today. But if you're somebody who said, yeah, I think I'm following Jesus and that's a decision I've made, then I really want you to pay attention and lean in to Luke's story that starts off right after last week's sermon from Dan about the um, trial of Jesus. This week we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. But before I get to the passage, I want to ask you a question. What can you control? What can I control? You know, every day we make hundreds of decisions and psychologists have spent lots of time researching how we make decisions. And one of the things they found is that people really make decisions unconsciously and they make them out of a lot of emotion. So this morning, you know, I thought about how much milk I want in my coffee. It wasn't really a choice. I just do what I do every day, right? And then as I was preparing for the sermon over the last few days, I did have a little bit of emotion about that. That was an emotional maybe pr thought process and reflection as I studied the word and prayed. So out of the millions of choices that we make every day, all of them usually are an effort to control our circumstances, to control the outcome of situations, and to control something that maybe we feel like we can't control, but by making decisions, we kind of take the reins back into our own hands. For those of us who are here in Kenya and got the news of another lockdown yesterday, I'm sure many of us are feeling like this morning, things are out of control again. You know, COVID is out of control. So what can I control, God? What choices can I make to make this different? And I have to be honest with you, this morning when I woke up, I was like, you know, God, the last lockdown, I don't know that I made the best choices. I don't know that I responded well. So I want to make different choices this time. And I don't necessarily need to be in complete control over everything. And as we look at the book of Luke this week, and we look at a very long passage, about 30 verses, we are going to see a cast of characters who are making choices about a situation they can't control. I'm going to just stop now and invite my son Solomon to read the passage that we're looking at today, which is Luke 23, verses 26 through 56. Uh, morning, church. Today's reading comes from uh, Luke 23. Verses 26 to 56. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the ch childless women, and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will, they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if the people do these things with, when the tree is green, what will, happen, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out to, with him to be executed. When they came to, him, when they came to, this, to the place where, called the skull, they crucified him there, and along with these, the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He said he saved others. He let him let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice about him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't, don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are, punished, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into, when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn to. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your, your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all of those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. 
Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to the decision and the act and action. He came from the Judean town of Ar Arithmia, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the, to the commandment. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Solomon. So, big passage, lots of characters, lots of choices, lots of things to think about this Sunday morning. Before I get into the passage, I want to tell you about an experience I had last week that was a lot of fun. Many of you have probably read the book or heard about the book, The Havoc of Choice by Wanjiru Konyangi. The Havoc of Choice came out a couple of months ago and I read it, loved it, and had the chance to interview the author. Um, the Havoc of Choice is set in Kenya in 2007 and 8 in the wake of post-election violence. It's a fictional story centered around the events of that December and January. I'm sure many of us remember it very, very well. We weren't living in Nairobi yet at the time, but I was here for actually a friend's wedding and remember very well watching the news, the power going out, the announcements in the days forth after the election. And in the havoc of choice, Wanjiru has a cast of characters who all experience the election very differently. There is a mother figure, there's a father figure, there's a musée, a, a grandfather figure. There are characters who are poor, there are characters who are wealthy, there are characters who are removed and a bit, you know, back from the situation. There are characters in the diaspora who are physically removed from the action but connected emotionally and personally to what's happening in Kenya. And in the havoc of choice, I think one thing that Wanjiru does so beautifully well is she really does make the reader feel the havoc of those moments, the havoc of both the tension leading up to the event and the, the living with the aftermath, living with the violence, living with the disruption and the confusion and the just utter horror at the events that followed when hundreds and hundreds of people lost their lives and justice was misplaced. The story in The Havoc of Choice is not too dissimilar from what we see just now in the book of Luke. We have a cast of characters also reacting to many things that happened, or a cast of characters actually reacting to one thing that happened, the trial and then the crucifixion of an innocent man, Jesus. And they react very, very differently. And a lot of their reactions, a lot of their choices are in response to what they can think or what they think they can control. You know, last week, Dan walked us through this, the passage of the trial, and I was really struck with the phrases that he used to capture the trial. He talked about it being an uh, incident of supreme injustice. And you see the crowd in today's passage reacting to that supreme injustice. You heard Solomon read about the way that soldiers reacted and the crowd reacted and two seemingly innocent bystanders, Simon and Joseph reacted, how the women reacted to that supreme injustice. And the other phrase that Dan used was this idea of God's relentless love. And in this passage, we also see that. We start to see people responding and even changing their choices because what they start to understand as Jesus is crucified and then dies by the end of this passage, that that act could only be motivated by deep and relentless love. Amen, kids? Amen. <laughs> we don't have an audience today because of COVID, but I am so delighted that my family is around me today. And, and let's just look at the passage again. Let's kind of break it up into three uh, parts and just see the choices that are being made in the middle of this havoc and how the crowd and the different characters respond. So in the first couple of verses, verses 26 through 34, we see the scene start to unfold. We see Simon, who is asked to carry the cross, and actually not even asked. The scripture says that he was seized 
and they, he was made to carry. So no choice at all in Simon's case. And the weight of crosses, the whole entire cross, was about 300 pounds, imagine. And the beam that he would have carried, which was the crossbar, would have been at least 75 to 100 pounds. So a lot of weight placed on a man out of the crowd. He's one character that we'll look at. The other people that we start to see in this passage are the women. The women who are weeping and wailing as they walk with Jesus. You see, the Roman soldiers and the Roman Empire at that time, crucifixions were a part of their judicial system. And the way that they often carried out these um, activities is that they would march the criminals a very long distance to the skull, the area that Jesus would be crucified, to Calvary. And they did this in order to raise the attention of people around so that people could see how the Roman Empire dealt with their enemies. So in this passage, Luke really hones in and gives us a sense of what's happening around Jesus as he's being marched, the, essentially the long way. There's no shortcut here. They intentionally take him a long route from the city out to the outer banks to where he will be crucified. And as he's walking, there are women walking with him who have been with him, it says, since Galilee, who are weeping and mourning. And during this time, he turns to them and he speaks to them and he says, don't cry for me. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves essentially because imagine if they would crucify an innocent person imagine what this empire what this kingdom this earthly kingdom is capable of so they're another set of characters in this havoc in this circumstances surrounding jesus's impending crucifixion who else do we see in this passage we also see the introduction of true criminals that are also going to be crucified next to jesus now, in other Gospels, in Matthew and Mark, we hear a little bit more from the criminals, from both of them. In this passage, we kind of hear a, a, a dialogue between the two of them that seems to indicate that one criminal is accusing Jesus along with the rest of, uh, the rest of the crowd, and the other criminal is actually responding and saying, hey, you know what, who are you to say this about him? We're, we're guilty, but he's not, he's innocent. And we see that second criminal asking Jesus to remember him and Jesus responding, not only will I remember you, but you'll be with me today in paradise. But in Matthew and Mark, there's actually more to their conversation. And both of those gospels record both criminals actually insulting Jesus. And then later on, the second criminal starting to change what he believes and what choices he's making. So another set of people in the havoc, the two criminals. As we go on into the next passage, 35 through 46, we see a few more characters. We start to see the crowd kind of pulled out in different segments. Luke starts, you know, when, when in Dan's passage rather, uh, earlier in 23, Luke writes the crowd as a more of a singular unit and pulling out the Sanhedrins, who were the ruling class of the Jewish society, and then the regular part of the crowd, and then of course the Romans. But in this passage, he seems to take that Jewish crowd and kind of disaggregate them even more. So at the beginning of 35, we see that there are people watching and rulers are sneering at him. Later on in that same 35, 36, we see soldiers coming up and mocking him. So now in this larger crowd, we see people who are sneering at him. We see soldiers who are mocking him. And we even see them offer him vinegar. Of course, that vinegar is to symbolize their total rejection of him as king. They've mocked him and called him the king of the Jews. And we know if that he was truly being honored, he would have been offered the finest of wines. And in a pure, just utter insult to Jesus, they offer him vinegar instead. Going on in this passage, we see his crucifixion and his death come to pass. And it says in verse uh, 43, after Jesus answers the criminal, actually in verse 44, it says, it was now about noon. The darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. The sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had done this, he had breathed his last. The pinnacle of this situation of Jesus' life comes in this moment where he completely succumbs to the Father's choice and surrenders his spirit and dies. And this Palm Sunday, as we start to reflect on the week ahead, which we all call Holy Week, or those of us who are churchy people call Holy Week, it's 
really poignant to remember and reflect and try and envision ourselves back on this day, on this Passover day many years ago. The Jews would have been traveling to their home cities to celebrate and observe the Passover with their families. We know that Jesus had just observed the Last Supper with his disciples. And with just a matter of 24 hours between the Last Supper and this moment, Jesus has been beaten, he has been tried, he has been mocked, he's been rejected. Decision after decision, choice after choice in the middle of this epic story. Let's look at the last passage, really long passage today. Starting in verse 47, we see people starting to react to Jesus' death. So I want you to keep in mind, much like the election of 2007 here in Kenya, where people experienced both the election and the aftermath differently, even though it was the same event, we see the same thing happening here, where after Jesus dies, these cast of characters start to experience his death and what they've just witnessed, or at least reflect on it, very differently. We have the centurion who pauses and says, surely this was a righteous man. That's a surprise because that centurion would have certainly been, of course, a Roman soldier who was in charge of a hundred men, and he certainly would have been a Gentile. And this Gentile recognizes what he's seen is not an ordinary man's death, and he praises God and says he was a righteous man. Another character that we see here um, in this uh, situation is we see um, Joseph. This man who would have been a, probably a wealthy Jew, he says he was a member of the council, he was good and upright, and that he didn't consent. So he's another part of this Jewish crowd that Luke starts to disaggregate. And I think it's a, it's a tender mercy, Luke in his writing, I think not only for the Jews who would have been reading this, but also for us hundreds and thousands of years later to say, you know what, they were not all the same. The same you know, crowd that was condemning him, they were not all thinking the same because it says that Joseph didn't consent. So it, means, it must have meant that he was there, he witnessed it, but he didn't consent. And instead this wealthy man, who would have had many of options because he's one of the elite in this society, chooses to do something extraordinary and ask Pilate for Jesus's body. And not only ask him for his body, but to invest his own funds in getting him a private tomb. It says the scripture said that no one had lain in that tomb before, which was incredibly uncommon in that day and age. He used his money, asked Pilate for the, the body, and it says he took his body down from the cross. And what a tender scene that he took his body, wrapped it in linen clothes, and placed it in a tomb. He touched Jesus, another character who made a different choice. And then we see the women again. Maybe the same women from the first part before Jesus died who were walking with him, or maybe a different group of women in that same crowd. But there's certainly an indication that these are women who knew him, the ones who came from Galilee with him. They follow Joseph and they follow the body and it's the Sabbath so they don't have time to prepare Jesus' body but it says that they go home and they start to prepare the spices needed to really honor Jesus' death and honor his body. One last character in this crowd are also in verse 49, those who knew him. Those who knew him. And certainly here, I think Luke is definitely talking about his disciples, the disciples who were his friends. And how about how many of you, how many of you have those friends who you wonder, do they really have your back? You know, it, when times get tough, are they going to be there for you? There's this phrase in pop culture, you know, it's somebody who's your ride or die, meaning that they're with you in good times and in bad. And it says here in verse 49 that those who knew him stood at a distance. A different part of the crowd, a different part set of characters making a different choice. So I've listed out a bunch of characters for you today and we're going to kind of dig into a couple of them as we get to the latter half of my sermon this morning. So let's quickly review these cast of characters and then we're going to hone in on a few of them and see what we can learn about the choices we make in response to the circumstances that we're in. So we have the soldiers who led Jesus away. Simon of Cyrene, who carried his cross. And by the way, Cyrene was probably the capital of North Africa, a province in North Africa that would have been a Jewish province. So shout out to the continent in this list. <laughs> we have the crowd who followed him, the women who mourned and wailed, 
the criminal who hurled insults, the criminal who asked to be remembered, the people who stood watching, saying, let him save himself, the rulers who sneered at him, the soldiers who mocked him, the centurion who praised God, the people who witnessed the sight, beat their breasts and went away, those who knew him and stood at a distance, and finally Joseph who asked for Jesus' body. And I just think, in my own mind, I love that the one who asked for Jesus' body is the same name as Jesus' father, Joseph. I have no idea if that has any biblical relevance, but I just thought it was a beautiful, just kind of, I don't know, moment in the gospel to see the name of his father reemerge at Jesus' death. So, a cast of characters in the middle of all of this havoc. So, I've mentioned many of them, but I want to come back to my question. What can we control? And I want us to look at how these characters respond to a circumstance that some of them maybe contributed to, but certainly could not control. And let's see how they respond, and what can we take away from what they did and the choices that they made. So, we've got one event, and we've got six choices that I want us to look at. One event, Jesus is the end of his trial, his crucifixion, his death, and then six choices, six characters that we're going to look at. So the first one I want us to look at is the criminal. And as I mentioned to you, in Matthew and Mark, it looks to be that there is evidence that both criminals were mocking Jesus. In fact, Matthew 17, 48 says, or 27, 48 says, in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So both of them, you can hear that plural form. The rebels heaped insults on him. But then in verse 42, we see him make a choice. Instead of going along with his comrade, who's on the other side of Jesus being crucified in himself, and imagine he's in excruciating pain as well when he makes, has this dialogue with Jesus. Instead of going along with the insults, he makes a different choice. And he says, to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The criminal makes a different choice. Then in verse 47, we come to the centurion, who I already mentioned was most definitely a Gentile, somebody who would not be believing, and not only that, but somebody outside of the Jewish system of relationship with God. He would have had no access to the God of the temple or the God of this historic faith that the Jews had. He would have had no access really to Jesus even. And yet, he makes a choice too. In verse 47, it says the centurion, seeing what had happened, seeing the death of Jesus, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. Imagine in witnessing the brutal um, beating of Jesus, his being mocked, and certainly the pain he would have been in. The centurion's response to that, the centurion's response to Jesus' prayer on the cross, his interaction with the criminal, his interaction with the crowd and the women, the centurion's response is so beautiful. He praised God. He must have thanked God that some goodness existed in the midst of this brutal, brutal reality that all of them were living under, under this Roman empire. And he says, surely this was a righteous man. Then in verse 48, we see the crowd. It says, when all the people had gathered to witness the sight, so again, everybody witnessing the same event, when they saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. Now, it's interesting that Luke depicts them this way because these again are his fellow Jews. And we might look at this and we might be like, ah, look at them, They, they didn't even stick around. But I want to contrast what's happening in verse 48 with what Dan talked about last week. If you listen to Dan's sermon, he talked about how that uh, crowd was insisting on Jesus's, on Jesus' body. They were insisting that he be crucified. They were going mad. Dan also talked about, if you remember, the transfer between Moy and Kibaki. So a lot of Kenyan politics, I guess, these last two weeks. That same crowd that was insisting on his crucifixion now is beating their breast. And that symbol of beating their breasts might sound a bit odd to us, but in that day and age, that symbolized sorrow. It symbolized repentance. It symbolized a changing of mind that you are now beating your breasts out of a sense of, woe is me, what have I done? How powerful a choice is that? That in the reflection and uh, witness to this event, just in 24 hours, this crowd has gone from insisting on crucifixion to mourning. 
So we have the criminal, the centurion, and the crowd, all witnessing the same event and all making slightly different choices and different responses. Let's look at three more characters. We're going to next look at the friends, the rich man, and the women. So verse 49, it says that all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Again, witnessing the same thing. I'm trying to kind of do a journalistic study of Luke today and, and point us all back that Luke is saying they all saw the same thing. They're all eyewitnesses of the same thing. And yet his friends here, they seem to stand at a distance. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that us often when things happen and we're just not sure how to take it in and start running towards God, we kind of put some distance there out of maybe a need for self-preservation. We've just seen Peter a few verses before denying that he even knew Jesus. Of course, the good news is, is that God comes to us and chases after us to bring us back. But I think we have to pause and acknowledge that in witnessing the same event, those who knew him made a heartbreaking choice to stand at a distance and very likely to preserve themselves, to, to protect themselves from what it meant to be associated with Jesus. Next, the rich man. We meet Joseph here. It said that he had not consented to their decision and action in verse 51. So again, action. He would have seen what happened, right? And in 52, he went to Pilate. Imagine this Jew going to the Pilate who had just been told by other Jews to crucify him. Now this Jew goes and says, give us his body. I mean, that's bold, right? And he risked that. And he said, give me his body. And he makes a cho choice to take the body down. And why? So that Jesus' body wouldn't be left there humiliated. So Jesus' body wouldn't be left there to be consumed by the animals, which is what the Romans would do. They would leave the body on the crosses and let them decompose. Again, to tell people, this is who we are as a Roman Empire. This is the punishment for anyone who defies us. And Joseph tries to restore a bit of dignity to Jesus. And I find it incredibly tender that what Luke says in 53 is he took him down and wrapped him. Doesn't that remind you a little bit about the way Jesus came into this world, being wrapped in clothes in the manger, also incredibly vulnerable. He came into this world and he died on this world in the same state of vulnerability. And Joseph makes a decision to risk his reputation, to risk his money, and to give in response to the sacrifice he saw Jesus making. He decides to give what he has to give Jesus a dignified burial. And lastly, in verse 55, we see the women, the women who have come and followed him. And it says in verse 56, they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. These women are not giving up on Jesus yet. Hallelujah. They have been with him. They have mourned and they have cried. They have witnessed his death. And they're like, you know what? He's dead, but we're still going to, we're going to, we're not, we're going to go back. It's the Sabbath. We have to get home. But tomorrow morning, we're going to be ready to go. So we're going to go home tonight and we're going to choose to be prepared for tomorrow so we can go and anoint his body and prepare his body. Another choice being made. So my friends, <laughs> the havoc of choice is real in our lives. We are all witnessing some hard days. It's just the reality. And goodness gracious, I, I know as a teaching team, we feel like we're kind of on repeat at times. Every week it's kind of like, sorry, guys, things are hard. Life is hard, but it's just the reality. And we all have choices we can make in response to that. In the coming week, we have seven days between now and Easter Sunday, the most important day for those of us who follow Jesus to remember his resurrection. How will we choose to spend another week in lockdown, and the week before we observe this resurrection. How, what choices will we make in the middle of the havoc that we're in? I think we have something that we can learn from these cast of characters. So let me tell you what I learned as I read about these characters. First of all, we can repent. If things are hard in our hearts and we've just chosen to walk away from God in the middle of these circumstances, it's really beautiful that Luke includes the picture of the criminal on his deathbed, moments away from death, saying, remember me, and God, just like that, extending grace to him and saying, I'll not only remember you today, but you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. Amen. 
that God offers us grace. And can I just say to you, I think God is offering a lot of us, not just the grace of salvation, a lot of us are, are saved, we're following Jesus, but the grace to kind of forgive ourselves, the grace to walk out of, you know, choices that we've made and patterns and habits that we are not proud of. And if you're feeling shame this morning, can I just offer you an Easter, early Easter special? That shame is not gonna serve you well. God's grace, on the other hand, can turn it around. So can I ask you to choose grace this morning, to choose repentance, to choose relationship with God instead of choosing whatever it is that makes you feel so distant from God. Would you do that today? Secondly, we learn from the centurion that we can thank God, we can give praise even in the middle of a mysterious situation. The centurion, who knows where his faith went from here? Surely he didn't understand everything that he was seeing, but he just knew he could thank God. So maybe if you're listening and you're watching it, and you're, again, you're not really sure about this faith thing, can I encourage you to maybe be like this character in the middle of this havoc who just said, I'm just gonna praise God. That seems like the right response today. Even in the mystery of circumstances, even in the mystery of faith, maybe you're also a believer, but you just haven't worked out some of the things, right? You're not sure what you think about this passage or that passage or this theology or that theology. You, you, like Jesus, you're not sure. Can I just encourage you to make a choice? to engage with God, to just witness God's goodness, even in the middle of uncertainty and in the mystery of faith. Third, the people in the crowd, the ones who beat their press. Man, I love this passage because just in the book before, we've seen them, again, insisting on Jesus being crucified. And here they make a different choice. They choose to pivot. They choose to pivot. I think the story of Easter, for those of us who follow Jesus, is the story of the Jews who on one hand asked to be crucified, on the other hand beat their breasts out of sorrow and woe and they pivot and they turn away from what they were just doing. Maybe they haven't arrived all the way yet into fully following Jesus, but they know where they were going wasn't good. And for some of us, we need to let go of like the rage that we're feeling and pivot towards the sorrow and tears. Some of us need to let go of the anger that the last year has brought into our hearts. We're angry about lost jobs. We're angry at the government. We're angry at the choices people are making. We're just full of anger. And that's what I see in the Jews. They've let the anger go here. And instead, they've just, they're holding on to sorrow. Sometimes tears are God's pathway to a new conversation with Him. It's a different choice to beat your breast, to be heart, heartbroken. But maybe those tears, maybe that sorrow would bring a release and a tenderness of heart that allows you to understand who God can be to you, that he can be father and friend. So some of us, I think, need to make a choice to move away, to pivot from rage to sorrow. A little bit of a different Palm Sunday service, right? <laughs> All right, three more characters and I'm going to go through them quickly. The friends. I think the friends are a lot of us today too. They stood at a distance. There are a lot of us here who are like, we need more evidence. We're not sure that God is good. We're not sure that God is gonna show up. So until God does A, B, and C, we're not gonna do it. Or maybe we're the type who are like, okay, tomorrow, if the weather is rainy, then I know God is saying, don't go. Or we're looking for God to show us a sign. We need more evidence. And because of that, we're standing at a distance, just seeing if God is gonna show up. That's a decision you can make. It's a choice that his friends made. But I would encourage you to think, and see, does that serve you well? Does that choice offer you more control by giving, putting distance between you and God? The rich man, his response to witnessing this event was to give generously and to give his very best. What if those of us who are able in this new lockdown can choose to give again generously? Yes, we are all tired emotionally, spiritually, financially, we're all tired, absolutely. But what if we made a choice in response to hard circumstances to give anyways? That's the choice that this rich man made. And I think it's a choice that demonstrates his faith. The rooster is giving me an amen. So amen, rooster. <laughs> Lastly, the women. I just love Luke. If you remember, I, I taught some months ago about another passage in Luke, and it was a surprise to me to hear that Luke mentions women more than any of the other Gospels. He includes women characters more than any of the other Gospels, so Luke is my man. Luke, in verse 55, mentions women again, and he says, you know, they went home to prepare to, uh, to uh, the spices and the perfumes. And for me, this was a choice to stay with Jesus. 
And it reminds me of what Job said in Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Isn't that what these women are doing? They're just like, Jesus, I'm holding on to you. I do not care. I don't have any other choice. I don't have anywhere else to go. You have the words of life. And though you slay me, I'm staying with you. These women make a choice in the middle of the havoc of seeing the one that they have followed since Galilee, the one that they have risked themselves to touch and to serve and to offer water to and to pour oil on. That man, the one they've risked everything for, they've just seen him die. They don't, they're not at resurrection yet. They're not at Sunday morning yet. They're at Friday night. They're at Friday night. And the choice they make is to stay to stay near to God, to stay with their choice to follow him, to stay with their choice to love this mysterious Jesus. So my friends, I've talked a lot about the choices that these cast of characters make. And I wanna encourage you to find yourself in that cast of characters this week. Take a moment, reread these passages. Are you the centurion? Are you the women? Are you the ones who knew him? Are you the criminal? Who are you in this story? But more than anything else, I want to remind you that God chose us. The, the reason this story matters, the reason their choices matters, is because the choice Jesus made to obey his Father even unto death. His choice, this Passover, this Good Friday, this Palm Sunday, this Easter morning, every single day, his choice is for us. His choice is to pursue us. His choice is to love us. His choice is to offer us a different kind of life and hope. In Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5, the, it says it so beautifully, a prophetic kind of, you know, um, whisper of what's ahead in Jesus' life. And I encourage you actually this week to read the entirety of Isaiah 53. But I'll just pull out a little bit. He was despised and rejected by men. He chose to be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men would hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, hallelujah. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, hallelujah, we are healed. That's the choice Jesus made for us. That's the choice he made to bridge heaven and earth, walk this earth for three, 33 years, die a brutal death, hallelujah, and next week choosing to get up again. That was always God's plan. And his, God's, his plan was always for us. It was always for you. His choice has always been for us. And it had no havoc. Hallelujah. It wasn't haphazard. It didn't catch God by surprise. It was a divine intention rooted in that relentless love, despite supreme injustice. Hallelujah. Rooted in relentless love, despite supreme injustice. He chose us. He chooses us today and every day. So this week, can I ask you, what will you choose? What will your choice be in response to God's grace, in response to God's offering and extension of his hand to you? What will you choose? Can I encourage you to turn away from rage and anger this week, to turn away from doubt and needing more evidence, to turn away from maybe your own just, you know, stubbornness and choose God? Choose to lean into him. Choose to touch him as Joseph did. Even that bloody, bruised, wounded body, Joseph decided to touch. And a lot of us are feeling that today too. Jesus, I don't want to come near because coming near feels hard and scary and uncertain. But I think God would invite us to do that today. So on this Palm Sunday, find your character, make your choice. And I pray that you'll choose Jesus. God bless you, LVC. Even though we won't be together next week, we look forward to celebrating Resurrection Sunday with you. He is alive. Love you. God bless you. See you next week.